Good day, scholars. Uh, today we are going to go through um, SS, US, H, uh, standard eight through nine, and this will cover the American uh, Civil War. Here in this chart, you can see the um, Missouri Car Compromise of 1820 to 1821, which is one of the leading factors that uh, led up to uh, the uh, American uh, Civil War. All right, the Missouri Compromise is the biggest issue of debate during the mid uh, 1800s, was over the balance of free uh, and slave states representation in Congress. Uh, before Missouri applied for statehood in 1819, there was an equal balance of 11 free and 11 uh, slave states in Congress. All right. Henry Clay's uh, Missouri Compromise included the following provisions. Uh, Maine and Missouri would both enter into uh, the Union. Uh, Maine would enter as a, a free state and Missouri would enter as a slave state, uh, thus preventing the balance, uh, preserving the balance in the Senate. Uh, the Louisiana Territory would be subject to a geographical division at the 36 degrees 30 uh, line of latitude, uh, which was Missouri's southern border. Um, slaves, slavery would be uh, prohibited north of the line, except in Missouri. Uh, slaves will remain untouched uh, south of the line, slavery would. All right, Western, westward expansion and manifest destiny. Uh, by 1850, uh, America had settled uh, California, Oregon, and Washington on the Pacific coast, driven by the belief in manifest destiny, something that we talked about prior. Uh, a phrase coined to describe the belief that America was to uh, expand and settle the entire uh, continent of North America. Uh, James K. Polk, the 11th president, uh, fulfilled the manifest destiny of the United States to uh, span the North American uh, continent from Atlantic to uh, the Pacific coastlines by annexing Texas. Uh, negotiating a treaty, uh, a treaty with uh, Great Britain for Oregon, uh, picked a war with Mexico for the southwestern states, and negotiated uh, the Gatson uh, purchase from Mexico. All right, James Polk, of course, as we said before, the 11th president of the United States, uh, during his presidency, America grew by more than one third in size. He was a big believer in uh, Manifest Destiny, which helped lead led uh, to his campaign campaign for uh, westward uh, expansion. Um, as you can see, here's a chart of uh, the motives for expansion. Uh, the desire for most Americans was to simply on land. Uh, the discovery of gold and other valuable resources. All right, what well, is another uh, expansion you say? The belief that the United States was destined to stretch across America. Of course, that's manifest destiny. And economy. It's always about them coins. and racist beliefs about Native Americans and Mexican people. Interesting. Moving forward. As you can see, we, we saw this uh, in our last uh, lecture, the picture of this uh, uh, 
manifest destiny, this imagery, this romanticism with uh, Europeans coming over or who have established themselves in the United States, believing that it is their God-given right to spread across America and uh, claim this land of America as their own. A big, 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 big deal. This was a big deal when Texas was annexed. All right. So uh, this was completed in 1845. Um, the U.S. annexed Texas from Mexico. So basically they took it from Mexico. Uh, it offered fertile lands to America. And uh, the Americans in Texas basically outnumbered the Mexicans. Uh, and they asked for statehood into the United States. Uh, Polk believed at the time that if the United States did not annex Texas, Mexico would declare war. So Polk needed uh, Northerners to approve the annexation of Texas. So he promised uh, them Oregon. All right, the United States, uh, the war with Mexico, the United States under the leadership of President James K. Polk took Texas into the Union in 1845. As a result, war broke out between the United States and Mexico over differing uh, frontier claims in Mexico. All right, uh, Mexico was so angry over Americans uh, bringing slavery into Texas since slavery was illegal in Mexico. The war proved to be uh, swift and decisive as Mexico lost not only their land claim in Texas, but also uh, all of California and New Mexico to the United States. All right, a couple of things that happened as a result of the war with Mexico. First of all, it was the Treaty of Guadalupe uh, Hidalgo uh, ended uh, the Mexican-American War in 1848. The provisions of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo included the Rio de Grande, uh, excuse me, the Rio Grande River would be recognized as the border between the United States and Mexico. Mexico succeeded uh, the territories of California and New Mexico eventually uh, becoming all a part of uh, seven states. The area became known as uh, Mexican secession. Excuse me, secession. Um, the United States paid 15 millions to Mexican government and assumed the claims of American citizens against the Mexican government, which is interesting because it's the same amount of money that they spent on uh, the Louisiana Purchase. All right, now you get to uh, a look at um, uh, what was purchased in the Gaston Purchase and Guadalupe Hidalgo um, Treaty moving forward. All right, now the Compromise of 1850. After uh, the Mexican-American War, California and other lands uh, won from Mexico began to apply for statehood. Uh, when, excuse me, California applied for free state, uh, Southerners worried that it would upset the balance in Congress, all right? So Henry Clay again came up with another compromise, uh, the Compromise of 1850. Uh, the terms included that California would come in as a free state, but New Mexico, Utah, and Texas would be slave states. Although slavery was abolished in Washington, D.C., the Fugitive uh, Slave Act was strengthened. As you can see here, we this is a uh, illustration of the uh, a map of the 1850 compromise. As you can see, the light blue states, I think that is, are free states and territories. 
um, the darker states are uh, slave states and the little beige looking states, of course, is open to slavery by principle of popular uh, sovereignty. All right, um, moving forward. Um, the Compromise of 1850. Um, Legislative items, as you can see, California admitted to the Union. Um, who was that a victory for? It was a clear victory for the North. Um, popular sovereignty to determine a slave issue in Utah and New Mexico territory. It was moderate victory for both sides. So both sides, uh, the uh, free states and the slave states, both would kind of benefited from that. Uh, Texas uh, border dispute with New Mexico resolved uh, as Texas received 10 million. Uh, that was moderately uh, Southern victory because of course that became a slave state for as Texas did. Uh, slave trade, but not only slavery itself abolished in the District of Columbia. So that's a moderate uh, view, I mean a moderate uh, victory for the North. Although slavery did, I mean, uh, the uh, trade of slavery did um, go on illegally at that time. Um, strong federal uh, enforcement of the new Fugitive Act. Of course, that was a clear um, victory for, for the South because simply because um, if a slave was a fugitive or ran away, that they could bring them back. All right, moving forward. All right, the Kansas-Nebraska Act. In 1854, Congress again uh, took up the issue of slavery in uh, proposed states and territories. The Kansas-Nebraska Act used popular sovereignty uh, ruled by a vote or the people, so they basically voted for it allowing the citizens of the territory to decide whether or not slavery would be allowed. All right, people from both sides flooded the territory just to cast a vote. At the end, there were more, more votes than people who actually lived in the territory. This voting was considered rigged, but the territory allowed the decision to stand. All right. Violence between the two sides created warlike conditions that led to the territory being uh, referred to as Bleeding Kansas. Popular sovereignty had failed. All right. Um, another picture of how we see these uh, states are developing as we go through uh, this crisis between uh, whether states should be uh, slave states or free states. All right. All right. Move it on. All right. Bleeding Kansas, the failure of popular sovereignty. As you can see in this illustration, this is the fight over uh, whether uh, slavery should exist in certain states or whether it shouldn't. Uh, it's, it's, it, it was a heck of a battle. Uh, by the end of 1856, 200 people had been killed in the skirmishes. Now, here we have um, the Supreme Court's ruling in Scott versus Sanders, which is a huge, huge point. Uh, the Supreme Court ruling in Dred Scott versus Sanford led to uh, civil war by settling a, a lawsuit in which a slave named Dred Scott claimed he should be a free man. He had lived with his master in slave states and in free states and believed he had been illegally held in uh, free states. All right. The Supreme Court rejected Scott's claim, ruling that no enslaved or free black uh, could be a citizen 
of the United States. The Dred Scott decision gave slavery the protection of the United States Constitution. Um, side note, eventually Scott was freed in May 1857, but he ended up dying um, nine months later. Kind of sucks, doesn't it? Moving on. Um, John Brown's raid, Harper's Ferry. All right, John Brown raid is another event that led to the Civil War. John Brown, an ardent abolitionist, decided to uh, fight uh, slavery with violence and kill it. Uh, believing that he was chosen by God to end slavery, in 1859, he led a group of white and black men in a raid on the Federal Armory at Harper's Ferry in Virginia uh, in hopes of arming slaves for a rebellion. The raid on Harper's Ferry, Ferry failed and Brown was convicted of treason against the state of Virginia and was executed by hanging. Um, the election of 1860. Another huge event. Uh, the trigger that set the Civil War in motion was the victory of the Republican candidate, Abraham Lincoln, in the election of 1860. Upon Lincoln's election, South Carolina voted to succeed or separate uh, from the United States. Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and then Texas followed South Carolina in their break from the United States. These lower states, uh, excuse me, these lower South uh, states were the original seven members of the Confederate States of America. Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina also joined the Confederacy as well. All right. Um, Here's a, a look at a chart into the uh, election of 1860. Uh, As you can see, Abraham Lincoln, who of course won, uh, he uh, prohibited slavery. His stance was prohibiting slavery in territories and contain slavery to where it exists. So he would rather just keep it to where it was and uh, allow other states um, to uh, be free or prohibit slavery, excuse me. And then we have John Breckinridge. He was a Democrat. He supported the federal slave code and territories and supported uh, popular uh, sovereignty where they could vote for uh, whether they wanted slaves or not. Now, Stephen Douglas, also a Democrat, opposed uh, federal slave codes and territories and supported uh, popular uh, sovereignty. All right. And then you had uh, John Bell. Uh, he was a constitutional union member and he his point of view was he avoided the slave issue and kept and keep the uh, country uh, united. A federal slave code uh, would uh, protect the interest of uh, slaveholders in territory. Uh, popular sovereignty allowed it uh, states to choose. Uh, to enter the Union as free uh, of slave. All right, moving forward. Um, the difference between the North and the South, uh, the North, of course, was the Union. 91% um, of the North was factory production. They used factory production. 71% of the total, pop they had 71% of the total population, 71% of the railroads, 75% of farmland, four, they were 4% of the cotton production. Uh, that's where North came out, 4% of that. And 180 million in bank deposits, 56 million in gold, and large Navy and trading fleet. But they had poor military leaders. Interesting. All right, now the South of the Confederacy, on the other hand, they only had 9% uh, of 
factory production. 29% of total population, 29% of railroads, 25% of foreign land, but 96% of cotton production. 47 million in bank deposits, 27 million in gold. And they had a small Navy and uh, trading fleet, but they had strong military leaders. So really, the Confederacy was almost doomed from the beginning because they just didn't have the resources that the Northerners did, as you can see. Moving forward. All right, comparing the North and South. All right, the North had a larger population from to draw soldiers from. They had a more extensive uh, transportation system with the railroads to move more resources. They had much greater industrial output to equip soldiers to fight. And they had uh, an economic, uh, an industrial, industrial economic economy with larger cities. And lastly, they had a large, a larger immigration, immigrant population to work in the factories for cheaper wages. Now, what did the South had? The South had strong military leadership that relied on efficient and strategic uh, strategy to uh, prolong the war. And they were a largely agricultural economy. All right, uh, President Abraham Lincoln and Lincoln's first and second inaugural inaugural address, he tried to urge Southerners to abandon the idea of succession and rejoin the United States. President Lincoln believed uh, preservation of the United States, or the Union as he called it, was the most important uh, task up for any president. Uh, Emancipation Proclamation, uh, September 22nd, 1862. In 1862, after the bloody battle at Antium, uh, Lincoln used executive power to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. The policy emancipated or freed uh, all slaves held in the states engaged in rebellion uh, of the Confederate. So basically, the Confederate. So uh, this is an important thing to understand because most people think that uh, the Emancipation uh, proclamation freed all the slaves. It did not. It only freed the slaves in the South. It was a strategical move uh, by President uh, Lincoln uh, to uh, help his efforts in uh, trying to defeat the Confederacy and bring them back into the Union. All right. So uh, since, as you saw before, that the South was so dependent upon their agriculture uh, to uh, uh, power their economy. Without those slaves, they could not do that. So with him freeing them, that hurt the South a great deal moving forward. All right. Uh, again, we take a look at the map and see how it has developed uh, as of uh, the 1860s. All right. All right. Lincoln uh, suspended habeas corpus, 1862. Uh, throughout the war, in some cases, Lincoln suspected the constitutional rights of habeas corpus, uh, the legal rule that anyone in prison must be taken uh, before a judge to determine if the prisoner is being legally held in custody. The Constitution allows a president to suspend habeas corpus during a national emergency. All right, the Civil War uh, from 1861 to 1865. All right, the Civil War starts with increased tension between the North and the South um, over slavery and sectionalism issues. Uh, South Carolina succeeds from the Union 
in December of 1860, of course, after the election of President Lincoln. Uh, by June 1861, 10 Southern states had succeeded. Many of the early battles were Union losses or fought to a draw. Jefferson Davis. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was the president of the United States. Jefferson Davis was the president of the Confederate States of America. Robert E. Lee, uh, the commander of the Confederate armor was of course Robert E. Lee. Uh, Lee's influence on the war was one of the most, one of the strong uh, military leadership. Uh, Ulysses Grant. Uh, Ulysses Grant uh, was promoted to full commander of the army in March of 1864. Uh, Robert E. Lee ultimately surrendered to General Lee at X oh, Apotomoc Courthouse in uh, Virginia on April 9th, 1865 to end the war. Uh, Thomas Stonewall Jackson was considered a brilliant tactician and was a great commander for Robert E. Lee's Confederate Army. He was accidentally killed uh, by his own men. All right, William Sherman. Ooh. William Sherman is noted for capturing the key Confederate city of Atlanta and subsequently leading the, mar the Union March to the sea uh, through Georgia. He believed in total war to completely devastate and kill uh, the will of the South, which he basically All right, major battles of the war. Uh, as you can see, uh, there were uh, battles in uh, Prairieville, um, Chattanooga, uh, Chickamauga, uh, Cor Corinth, uh, Jackson, Mississippi, that's where I was born, Vicksburg, Mississippi, uh, Port, H uh, Port Hudson, uh, Pea Ridge. So they were, as you can see, they were all across the South, and as you can see, they were moving closer and closer down into the South with each uh, uh, victory. And uh, and our defeat in some cases. Um, Gettysburg was a huge battle, as you can see over here uh, to your right. Gettysburg was a huge battle. All right, uh, moving forward. All right, Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina. The Battle of Fort Sumter was fought in April 61, uh, 1861. Not only did this battle begin the war, but it also prompted the states of the Upper South to join the Confederacy. Uh, Anto, Antonym, Antonym, Ant, whoo, Antium, uh, September 1862. The Battle of Antium uh, was fought in September 1862. It was instead uh, the deadliest one-day battle uh, in American history with over 24,000 casualties. After the loss, after the Confederate loss at the Battle of Antium, Lincoln issued uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, July 1st through the 3rd, 1863. The Battle of Gettysburg was found uh, fought, excuse me, in July 1863. Uh, it was the deadliest battle of the American Civil War. Gettysburg marched the, marked the beginning of the end for the Confederate forces in the East and was the turning point of the Civil War. All right. Excuse me. Vicksburg, Mississippi, July 4th, 1863. The Battle of Vicksburg was fought over a span of two months from May uh, through July 1863. Um, the Union won and took control of the Mississippi River, cutting off the Confederate supply line. 
right. Uh, the Battle of Atlanta was fought from July through September 1864. Uh, Union General um, William Sherman burned Atlanta to the ground, then marched across Georgia to the Atlantic Ocean and on through the Carolina. During Sherman's march to the sea, Sherman and his men engaged in total war as they destroyed the railways, roads, and bridges along the path. This battle devastated the South and eventually led to its uh, surrender. Civil War ends. Robert E. Lee surrenders to uh, General Grant at Appomattox Mod uh, Courthouse in Virginia on April 9th. Uh, 1865 to end the war. Why the North won? They had greater technology advances, larger population, more abundant resources, good military leaders, and South used up, the South used up all its resources. All right, uh, moving forward. Uh, Northern and Southern resources. Um, as you can see, I mean, it just, the numbers just didn't add up for the South. Um, the population, I mean, it, they almost had what double, more than double their population. I mean, the manufactured goods, I mean, it's at 92%. So, I mean, it's outside of cotton, they had no advantage. They had no advantage at all. Moving forward. Uh, roles of African American and women in the Civil War. Women served in the war as nurses, authors, abolitionists, and activists. Uh, African Americans served in the war as soldiers, uh, mainly the 54th Massachusetts Regiment. They were spies, they were cooks, and various other uh, support roles as well. Uh, the effects on the economy. North, uh, the industry boomed. Um, factories underwent industrialization, uh, helping the U.S. become a global world power. Um, as for the South, uh, many cities laid in ruins. Uh, roads and factories were ruined. They had to rely on uh, northern investments. And agriculture uh, still was the main focus. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our lecture for today. Um, as always, if you want to contact me, uh, you have multiple platforms in which you can contact me, uh, the best being the Remind app. And um, of course, you can always email me as well as call my desk phone or the classroom phone. Keep in mind, the classroom phone will go straight to a message. Uh, but if you leave a message, I will get back with you as soon as I possibly can. All calls or emails received after 3.30 p.m. will be answered uh, on the following uh, workday at my earliest convenience. Um, all right. It, remind, also a reminder, uh, if you want to uh, uh, have a tutorial with me, um, our tutorials are uh, from 8 a.m. to uh, 1.30 uh, p.m., but you must make up an appointment. All right, guys. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.